If you're running away from God, expect a storm. God loves you enough that he's not going to let you go, and he's not going to allow you to keep wasting your life, so expect a storm. He is determined enough for you to live in his will that he won't let you have smooth sailing until you do, so expect a storm. Don't be surprised when the winds begin to blow. Don't be surprised when the waves break over your bow. Don't be surprised when your little escape ship begins to break up. Expect a storm, but know this, even in your storm, God is still in control. The ship should have broken up and sunk, but it didn't because God was in control. The sailors on that ship should have drowned, but they didn't because God was in control. Everything that we believe is based upon our perception of God. Everything that we believe about life, everything that we believe about marriage, Everything that we believe about family, about Christianity, everything that we believe about love and finances and millions of other things is based upon how we perceive God. So it would only stand to reason that if our perception of God is wrong, then everything else in our life will be wrong. If we're misinformed as to who God is and how God is involved in our life, if our basic premise concerning our Creator is skewed in any way, then everything else in our life, our view of reality, our thoughts about eternity, our purpose in life, and our destination for the future will all be wrong. The world that we live in is in a horrible state because most people have the wrong perception of who God is. Some people think that God is just who they imagine him to be. Some people think that God is just whatever name you want to call him or however you want to worship him, that it doesn't matter. Some people uh, see God as they want to see God. They, they view God as they need him to be or as they want him to be. They view him through the misinformed opinions of people who have no idea who God is either, but they don't view God as the Bible describes him to be. And the result is the ongoing mess that they call their life and the chaos that's in our world today. So what does the Bible say about God? The Bible informs us that God is omnipresent, meaning that God is everywhere at all times. Our creator God right now is in the past, he is in the present, and he's also at this very moment in the future. And God sees it all at at the very same time as a present reality. Now, we can't wrap our brain around that because we're limited by time. We're stuck in the framework of time. We are stuck turning our clock ahead at 2 in the morning because somebody tells us to. But God is not stuck in time. So God can be in the past. He can be in the present. He can be in the future all at the very same time. At this very moment, God is in Jerusalem, he's in Moscow, he's in Beijing, he's in Washington, D.C., and he's here with us because God and only God has the ability to be everywhere at once. The Bible also teaches us that God is omniscient, meaning that he knows all things and there isn't anything that he doesn't know. There will never be a new idea pop into God's mind because all ideas already exist there. Nothing ever takes God by surprise. He doesn't miscalculate or make mistakes. He can't be outwitted or taken advantage of because there isn't anything that God doesn't know. The Bible says that God is also omnipotent, meaning that he is all-powerful and sovereignly in control of absolutely everything. No one outranks him. No one can overpower him. He can't be overthrown or impeached, and he will never resign. Whether it's good or bad, strong or weak, the very best efforts of man can't even come close to usurping the power and the control of God. God said to Jonah, arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it because their wickedness has come up before me. Now, I I like to kind of overlay Bible maps with present-day maps, When we talk about Assyria here in the Bible, does anybody know where that is now? Anybody? Assyria, a little bit of a clue there. Very, very, boy, you people are sharp today. There's still conflict. There's still conflict with these people. God knows who needs to be preached to, God knows who needs to hear the gospel. 
Jesus said in, in Luke 5, 32, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. In Luke 19, 10, Jesus said, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. You know, I may preach to church people on Sunday morning because God knows that some church people are lost and they need to be saved. But there's a reason why our congregation sponsors TV programs and radio programs and on secular stations. There's a reason that we put our message out to the world over the Internet. There's a reason why we're building churches in foreign lands where there are no churches. There's a reason that we serve the Lord with dirty hands. It's because we have been commissioned to take the saving gospel of Jesus to the lost and to this world. God said, Jonah, rise, get up. I have something for you to do. Now, if you're ever going to make anything of your life, you have to get up from where you are and move when God tells you to move. You might have found it hard this morning when your alarm went off because somewhere in your brain is telling you, you missed an hour. You missed an hour of sleep, but you knew if you didn't get up out of bed, you weren't going to get anything done today. Your chains won't fall off until you get up. You're not going to be free until you get up. God can't use you until you get the energy and the tenacity to break from the status quo and get up out of your bed and do something with your life. But you have to get up. God has a divine call on your life. He didn't take the time to create you and give you life just so you could take up space on earth. God has an assignment for you. He has a divine, one-of-a-kind plan for your life, but you'll never get it done until you stop feeling sorry for yourself and being mad at everybody and throwing your tantrum and having your little pity party and just get up. You have to get up. And then once you're up, you have to hone in on what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. You have to start listening for what God wants you to do next. God's not going to go, well, he's up. I'm happy. No. you got to get up, and then you got to listen. What does God want me to do? God is giving directions and instructions for you to follow. He has a plan. But to know and understand what God's plan is, you have to listen closely for his voice. That means that you have to turn down the volume of other things in your life and seek him so you can clearly and distinctly hear what God is saying to you. Sometimes we keep the volume up so high on the trivial things in our life that we expect God, if he wants to be heard, to shout out above the noise. Too many of us are sitting around with the TV blaring and the stereo blasting and a friend shouting and we're waiting for a sign. We want to see the sky open up and hear angels singing or hear the voice of God thunder from a shrub in our backyard. We want lightning bolts and and water to part or a pillar of, of fire to appear. We want something big. We want something spectacular. We want something that drowns out the noise. We think that if God wants something from us, then he ought to do something to get our attention first. But God isn't obligated to get your attention. You're obligated to get his. God said, Jonah, Get up. This is what I want you to do. But Jonah's response was, I don't want to. I don't want to. Have you ever told God no? It takes a lot of nerve or a whole lot of stupidity to stand in the face of God and tell him no. Jonah said to God, no, I don't want to. Now, as far as we know from the Bible, Jonah was the only true prophet of God who disobeyed a direct commission to preach. I guess that most people had more sense than that, but there was something deep within Jonah that rebelled against God's call on his life. Maybe you know what God wants you to do with your life, but there's something inside of you that is keeping you from obeying God's call. God has given you a direct order, but you're being rebellious and you're being insubordinate and you're telling God, no, I'm not going to do it. Why would Jonah do that? Why would anyone disobey a direct command from their creator? Jonah had a past. We all have a past that sometimes gets in our way. We can't seem to move forward because of something that's in our rearview mirror. There's an anchor in our past that restrains us from reaching our destiny. We're wasting days and years of our life not doing what God created us for, marinating in our memories and not obeying God's command to move forward because of something buried in the archives of our history. Maybe it's a past sin that we've committed and we think that it's too bad of a sin for God to forgive and forget. Or maybe it's something terrible that somebody else has done to us. We were victimized, and we can't let go of it. 
But until we deal with whatever it is, we will sit and waste the life that God has given us doing nothing. Jonah had a past. The Ninevites were Assyrians, and Assyrians were terrorists. Terrorism isn't anything new. The devil's been doing, using it since the beginning. The Assyrians were terrorists. They would, wouldn't just kill soldiers who fought against their soldiers, but they would slay innocent victims. The, by, they would burn young men and women in huge bonfires. They would impale people, uh, living people, on, on stakes. They would behead city leaders and stack their, their heads outside of the city gates. They would adorn themselves with necklaces that were strong from the toes of their victims. They were even known to peel the skin from victims and hang it as a trophy in their home. These were wicked and evil people with no feelings and no emotions for anybody but themselves. But Jonah had a past, and his past involved these Assyrians. Fifty years before the time of Jonah, Shalmaneser, an Assyrian king, wrote an inscription of his hideous acts on Mount Carmel. But on his way to Mount Carmel, he victimized a little town called Gethhefer, which just happened to be Jonah's hometown. He tortured and murdered the members of Jonah's family who lived there. Jonah knew all about it. He had heard the stories for years, and maybe he was even there when it took place. But now God has commanded him to go and preach repentance and forgiveness to these people. Jonah had a past, and his past led him to a prejudice. Prejudices always begin with a justifiable reason. Nobody ever decides one day that they're just going to hate somebody else. There has to be a reason for their hate, but there's always a reason. And often that reason is passed from generation to generation until the truth of it gets buried in tradition. The Hatfields are feuding with the McCoys, but nobody, none of them know why. They just know that they're supposed to do it. Are there people in your life that you hate just because you're supposed to? Are there prejudices that you carry that have been taught you and handed down to you? Is there somebody that you hate because you're supposed to hate them, but you really have no idea why? There are people today outside of the church who hate the church because somebody told them that they're supposed to. They've been taught all of their life that Christians are hypocrites and the church is just a temple of lies. And I've got to be honest with you, some church people have not helped the situation. Jonah had been trained all of his life to hate the Assyrians, even though what they'd done was 50 years ago. He hated them, and he believed that he had the right to hate them. He, they deserved to be hated. He, why would God want to preach to these people? Why would God want to forgive them? So Jonah began to think of reasons why he wasn't obligated to, avoid, to obey the command of God. And Jonah's past that led to his prejudice then led Jonah to a problem. Is there anyone in your life that you don't want God to forgive? I want you to think about this. Is there anybody from your past or anyone in your life at this moment that you despise? They've hurt you or they've hurt somebody that you love and you hate them. Or maybe you don't even know why you hate them. You just think that you're supposed to. Now, you won't come right out and say that you hate them. And if somebody asks you, you're going to be a good Christian and say that you love them because you love all people. But you know that deep down in your heart, if you had your way, they would die and burn in hell for eternity because they deserve that kind of hate. We're heading into some uncomfortable places here now, aren't we? We're tampering with a locked door in the back of your mind. We're going somewhere that you've marked off limits. But listen to me. You'll never be free until you deal with your prejudice in the light of God's wisdom. What if God told you that he wanted you to go and witness to that person that you hate and share with them God's message of forgiveness? Jonah didn't realize it, but he was trapped in a prison that he had built for his enemies. He was keeping himself from fulfilling God's plan for his life. He was making himself miserable. He might as well have died 50 years earlier with everybody else because he really wasn't living his life now. <clears throat> There's some things that we need to let go of if we're ever going to fulfill our divine destiny. There are, there's a time to put things away. Have you ever put stuff away? You may know what God wants you to do with your life, but there's something deep within you that's keeping you from obeying God. You have a past that Satan is throwing in your face. And that past has become a wall that stands between you and your purpose in life. Your past has led you to a prejudice that's keeping you from where God wants you to go. But I want you to know that God is going to confront you with it, and your prejudice is about to give you one whale of a problem. 
God commanded Jonah to go and preach repentance to the Ninevites, but Jonah refused because Jonah didn't want God to forgive those kind of people. Jonah must have had tremendous confidence in the power of the gospel. He didn't want to go and preach to the Ninevites because he knew that if he did, they would repent and serve God. That's confidence in the power of the gospel. As rebellious and messed up as Jonah was at this time in his life, he still understood the power of the gospel message. 1 Corinthians 1.20 says, Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by the wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Verse 3 says, Jonah rose up to flee. He got up, but he purposely went the wrong direction. He fled from the presence of the Lord. He intentionally went the wrong way. Now, when God, uh, was, God spoke, Jonah rose up, but he took off in the opposite direction where God wanted him to go. And instead of Nineveh, the Bible says that he went down to Joppa. When you run away from God's plan for your life, it's going to be a downhill spiral. Every step that you take away uh, from God's will for your life is going to be one step deeper into the valley. And the longer you run away from God, the lower that valley is going to get until one day you will find yourself hitting rock bottom. Jonah boarded a ship, and he went down to the bottom of it. He thought that he was safe. He thought that he had made it. He thought that maybe now God would forget about him. Maybe now God would change his mind and leave him alone. But what Jonah didn't understand was when he went down to Joppa, God was there. When he boarded the ship for Tarshish, God was on the ship. When he went down into the cargo hold, out of the light of day and into the darkness, God was even there, his hand still leading him and his right hand still holding him. God wasn't going to sit idly by and allow his prophet to avoid doing what he commissioned him to do. God refused to just stand back and allow Jonah to forsake his calling. I want you to know God will outlast you. God will outlast you. You can run, but you can't hide. You can track. He'll track you down, and he will confront you, and he will make you deal with your rebellion. Where can I go from your presence? We'll soon be in the spring months. And around here, the months of April, May, and June are storm months. I used to fear those months as a kid because I thought that was tornado time. It's the time of year when we have these major thunderstorms and tornadoes. Nobody likes a storm. Some people might enjoy a little bit of rain or an occasionally overcast day, but nobody likes a storm. We don't like a storm because storms are scary and they can be destructive and they're very unpredictable. Nobody is safe in a storm. Listen closely to what I'm about to say. God isn't beyond sending a storm into your life to get your attention and turn your direction. We like to think of God as just a God of blessing and good things. We like to think of God as just a God of healing and help. We like to think of him as the great grandpa in the sky who will let us slide when we get out of line. But the story of Jonah is telling us that sometimes God is willing to send a storm into our life to turn us back in the right direction. If you're running away from God, expect a storm. God loves you enough that he's not going to let you go, and he's not going to allow you to keep wasting your life, so expect a storm. He is determined enough for you to live in his will that he won't let you have smooth sailing until you do, so expect a storm. Don't be surprised when the winds begin to blow. Don't be surprised when the waves break over your bow. Don't be surprised when your little escape ship begins to break up. Expect a storm, but know this, even in your storm, God is still in control. The ship should have broken up and sunk, but it didn't because God was in control. The sailors on that ship should have drowned, but they didn't because God was in control. Jonah didn't expect mercy from God. And at this point in time, I'm not sure that he even wanted it. Jonah had no desire to pray and ask God for forgiveness. He had no thought of calling out to God for help. He was the one that ran away. He was the one that disobeyed. He was the one that created this mess. He wasn't being the prophet that he should be. He wasn't the man of God that he should be. But what Jonah didn't know, that even though he wasn't the man of God that he should be, it didn't change who God was. Are you following me? It all has to do with how you perceive God. No matter how far you run, no matter where you go, no matter how deep the depths of your rebellion will take you, God is still who he is. And he doesn't change. He's still a God of mercy. He's still a God of compassion. He's still a God of forgiveness. He still loves you. And his desire isn't to destroy you, but to restore you to the plan that he has designed for your life. I'm talking to somebody this morning. 
Now, here's another part of the story happening that we sometimes forget about. Because of Jonah's disobedience to God, everybody on the ship was in danger. This storm was happening because of Jonah, but he had drawn innocent people into his storm. There isn't a sin that you commit that only involves you. The consequences of your rebellion can be far-reaching. It can reach into your family. It can reach into your children and into your grandchildren. It can spread through your community all because of you. Who have you drawn into your storm? How many lives have you jeopardized because you have been running away from God? Dad, you've taken your wife and your children into danger because of your rebellion. Mom, you have carried your husband and your kids into a mess because you're running away from God. Teenager, what are you doing to your parents and what negative influence are you having on your brothers and sisters? Who have you drawn into your storm? Everybody was in danger because of Jonah's disobedience. But Jonah was still reluctant to obey. But he had a solution. He said, just pick me up and throw me into the sea, and it'll become calm. It's my fault that this storm has come on you. So just throw me overboard. We hear that sometimes from people. Yeah, I'd be better if, if I died, everybody would be happy. Jonah said, just throw me overboard. Just throw me overboard. Now, that might sound noble at first. Throw me overboard, and you'll be safe. But that wasn't what was on Jonah's mind. See, Jonah had it all figured out. If he was dead, then he couldn't preach. And if he couldn't preach, the Ninevites wouldn't repent and be saved. If he would die in his death, he could destroy all of the Ninevites. He was probably thinking of himself as some kind of martyr, a hero to his hometown. But God is nobody's fool. You might think that you're smart enough to outwit God. You might think that you found a loophole, but God's about to show you who's boss. God will bring you back to where he wants you to be, but he may not do it under the most pleasant of circumstances. The book of Jonah uses two terms, great fish and whale. People get up in arms, you know, they argue about that. Well, which one was it? Was it a great fish or was it a whale? I always say it's a whale of great fish. You know, but actually the, the literal interpretation of both of those words are, is sea monster, sea creature, something large. God didn't send a ferry boat to pick up Jonah. He didn't charter a yacht to bring him back. This wasn't a love boat that came to his rescue. But the Bible says that God sent a great fish, and that whale of a fish swallowed Jonah, and he spent three days and three nights in the belly of this sea monster. I was thinking about what this was like. You ever go to a water park and go down a water tube? See your hand. Did you like it? Years ago, when we were younger in not as intelligent. Uh, we went to a water park, and, and uh, of course, the guys went down the water slide first. This was a black tube. You couldn't see anything, and it twist and turn. And, uh, you know, they always tell you put, you know, put your one foot over top of the other one, put your hands up on your chest. This way you go like a 1,000 mile an hour. Uh, I'm headed down this water slide, and immediately the water starts hitting me in the face, and I can't breathe because I don't have gills. <laughs> And I'm thinking, is this ever going to be over? Am I going to drown in this thing? It's pitch black, water hitting me in the face. I'm thinking, this must be how Jonah felt, you know? I don't do those anymore. <laughs> but he was in the belly of this fish. Now, Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the sea creature. And in Matthew 12, Jesus compared Jonah's experience with three days and three nights that he would spend in the grave. Not meaning the tomb of the earth, but rather the belly of hell. Now, I did some research. There, there are great fish in the Mediterranean Sea that are big enough to swallow a man. The blue whale and the sperm whale are big enough, and the great white shark and the whale shark are large enough to swallow a man whole. Now, if you're given a choice of one of those four, which one would you pick? Yeah, none of the above. It's known that the sperm whale doesn't chew its food. Hallelujah. So some believe that this was the great fish that swallowed Jonah. The Encarta Encyclopedia reports when whales swallow food, it travels through the esophagus to a multi-chambered stomach that resembles the stomachs of hoofed animals such as cattle and sheep and deer. And in the first stomach chamber, a sac-like extension of the esophagus, food is crushed. In the second chamber, uh, 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 digestive juices further break down the food. Now, if Jonah remained in the first chamber, 
He only needed to worry about being crushed rather than being digested. Sharks, however, have a much slower metabolism, and a human body could last three days without deteriorating in the belly of a shark. Now, I'm reading this wondering what it was like, and my mind shoots right back to that water tube. I believe that Jonah thought that he would be cast overboard and he would drown, and that'd be a terrible fate. But something happened to Jonah that he wasn't prepared for. God kept him from instant death. But instead, he surrounded Jonah with death for three days and three nights. To drown in the sea would have been horrific, but it would have been rather quick, and then it would have been over. But God is the ruler of life and death, and God suspended Jonah's life while he was in the grave. We've all had nightmares of what it would be like to be buried alive or to be trapped and drowned underwater. In the darkness, we would gasp for air, always wondering if our next breath was going to be our last. But with salt water in his eyes and in his lungs and the stench of the whale's former meals deteriorating around him, with the acids of the stomach uh, eating away at his flesh, Jonah got a first-hand taste of what hell would be like. It was from inside of that terrible place that Jonah prayed to the Lord. When he was running away from God, he didn't want to to talk to God. He didn't want to pray. When he was hiding from God, he didn't want to talk to him. But now, after three days in the bowels of despair, Jonah had time to review his life. And Jonah prayed. Jonah said to the Lord, what I have vowed, I will make good. And the Bible says that God spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah up upon the dry land, which just goes to show you can't keep a good man down. There with his hair eaten away, his skin bleached by the stomach acids of this great fish and his tattered clothes smelling from the contents of the whale's belly. God said to Jonah once again, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it what I tell you. Guess what Jonah's answer was this time? I'll do it. I'll do it. God is a God of second chances. He has a plan for your life, and you'll never be happy until you submit to his will. You might be running away, but God is right there with you. You might be hiding, but God's in your hiding place. You might be living in your own hell right now. Your life is falling apart and you're a mess. But you understand that God is with you and he has a hold of you because he loves you. You've rebelled and you've ran away, but God has brought you to this place so that you will have to deal with him. There's nowhere you can go to flee his presence. So my message to you this morning is it's time to stop running. It's time to stop running. It's time to stop and and to pray, to get down on your knees and to turn from your rebellion. It's time to repent of your sin and your disobedience to God and make good your vow. Make good your calling that he's placed on your life.